My plan today is to talk for about 35 minutes, show pictures. Um, and, and I've been birding for about eight years pretty seriously. And when I say pretty seriously, I mean, I go birding four or five mornings a, a week. So I'm out looking for birds because I enjoy the solitude. I like being out in nature and it's kind of fun to see what we detect. So I have three goals for the talk today. The main goal is just to have fun showing pictures of lots of cool birds. Uh, second goal is to uh, answer some of the questions which people usually ask me when they hear that I go out looking for birds. And three, I wanna encourage everybody to go out and look, you know, go out and look and listen and see if you can find birds. Bird watching is, I sort of view it as a little bit of a stealth sport. You know, if you're not paying attention to birds, you don't see any, but if you start listening and looking, then you can often see the ones that are around you. So the pictures I'm showing today are mostly around here. I thought I'd try to encourage people because they're accessible. You know, they're, if we're really out looking, you can see them. So I'm going to show some pictures of birds, answer one of the questions, show some more pictures of birds, answer a question. That's the way I'm going to go uh, for the talk. Let me share this, my screen. Okay, can people see that I'm assuming? If not, maybe put something in the chat or whatever. Um, so the first set of birds, I picked a, a collection that kind of shows the variety of birds, color, size, behavior, things like that. This, a, this is a pair of Western greeds that are performing a mating ritual. I didn't realize birds could run across the water or walk on water. Um, here's what a Western grebe looks like when it's just sitting on the water, you know, because they, they do things pretty differently when they're running across it. I was also surprised to find out there are other birds that do this. So when I was in Florida at my hometown in Gainesville, Florida, I went bird watching and I saw these uh, American coots running on the water. And I, after watching them for a while, I walked down the trail a bit and I came across this. Um, I grew up in Florida, as I say, so I've seen a lot of alligators, but this has got to be one of the biggest ones I'd seen along any sort of outdoor trail. It's about eight or nine feet long and looked pretty serious. So I gave it pretty wide berth. A little further south in Florida, I saw this wood stork. Uh, it's about three and a half feet tall when it's standing up. Now it's sort of kneeling, you can see on the ground. Back here in California, I was walking along the trail down in San Jose along Guadalupe Creek and came across this bird, actually a pair of birds I'll show you in a second. This is a wood duck. And whenever I see them, I always think that it was some child was painting them and said, I think I'll make it blue on back and so, you know, some white stripes here and maybe a little red around this and so forth. So it's always like uh, a fancy color. Wood ducks are one of those kinds of birds where the male and female look quite different. So here's a male and female, it's actually that same duck and a mate. Other birds, they pretty much look the same, the male and female. So here are Townsend warblers that we see here in this area. The male and female are pretty close. The, the female may be a slightly fainter, you know, not quite as saturated colors. I put this in just because I thought it was funny. A female mallard is looked to me like it was scolding a mute swan. Here's a green heron just sitting there like you normally see them. 
but when they go after food, they can transform themselves into pretty different uh, styles. So here is that same, this is the same heron going after a fish. Here's a pair of white-tailed kites. We see those in arrested arrow open space. They look pretty intent. This is a frigate bird that I saw in Panama, just to give you a variety of other sizes and shapes. Here's a chucker I saw in Hawaii. Here's a silly red-tailed hawk uh, bending his head over to the side. My neck doesn't do that. Ring neck. Pheasant, I saw this was actually in Palo Alto Baylands a few years ago. Here's a little, one even closer I saw in uh, Contra Costa County not too long ago. Here, every, every duck is envious of a blue bill here. These are ruddy ducks and you often see hundreds of those in the Baylands. Uh, earlier this week, I saw probably 20 or 30 of them and a couple of uh, wild turkeys. So I end this little section with a bird that's pretty amazing. It's an amaz it's a American dipper that I saw in Los Gatos. It looks for food along rocks underwater. So it can walk on the stream underneath the stream uh, as it examines the rocks. And here I'll show you it is as it's moving along the rocks up high. So it's looking on the rocks for things to eat. So I say there's a pair of these that, that sort of lives in Los Gatos that you can often see. So probably the first question somebody asks when they find out I'm a birder is they say, do you keep a list? you know, what a birders would call a life list. And, and short answer is yes, I do. And in fact, I use a, an app that was developed by Cornell called eBird. Cornell has probably the largest ornithological, ornithology department or center in the world, probably has 100, 150 people researching birds and, you know, how to keep them healthy, how to count them, how to figure out where they go, how, how is climate changing affecting and things like that. Here you'll notice my life list up that says I've seen 781 species in my eight years. Um, just to put that in context, there are 10,700 known species of birds. So I haven't even seen 10%. Um, also says that there on the right that I've uh, turned in 2,555 checklists. So when I go out for a hike, I record what birds I have with eBird and turn in the list. And that's a checklist. Although this is a little misleading because often I turn in two checklists. They, if I go out someplace through two or three miles and then come back, they want one checklist for going out and one checklist coming in. So I figure I've been on maybe 1600 hikes in eight years, which is 200 a year. So that's about right. Here's my actual life list. 781 was a painted red start I saw down at Agnew's, uh, used to be the Agnew's Mental Hospital, it's now a park in Santa Clara. And the bird before that, 780, was a lesser kestrel I saw in Israel a little over a month ago. So eBird keeps track of every bird I've ever seen in these eight years. And it can tell you a whole bunch of things about them. You know, you can look at the statistics in all sorts of ways. So this one shows in the middle of the chart, it shows what birds I've seen this year. It says I've seen 343 different birds this year. Uh, and in October down at the bottom, it says I've seen 56. Well, this was, I actually took this in October 6th. So gives you some idea, but they also keep track of what counties I've reported birds in in California. You know, what states I've reported birds in, in in the United States and what countries. So they say they keep track of everything. And they use this, they give this information to other scientists to track uh, migration. So they now have a much better idea of where 
uh, birds go when and how long they fly and things like that. So it's part of, they eat, Cornell uses it as part of citizen science data. When I'm actually on a hike, this is a zoom in on my phone. Um, so this is pretending like I'm in the middle of a hike, which I was uh, over at, uh, uh, in Alviso on, on a hike. I'd already seen four least sandpipers and a whole bunch of other birds. And I just saw two Western sandpipers. So all I need to do to type it in, I mean, to enter it is I type two space S-A-N-D and it shows me the kind of sandpipers that might be around. And notice some are marked as rare, the R's on the right and others like Western sandpiper. So I just click on Western sandpiper and go back to looking at birds. So it takes me like six or seven clicks to enter birds. When I get home, uh, the same app from, from Cornell, I can look at the list. Here it says I saw 30 northern shovelers, six gadwall ducks, four mallards, two anna's hummingbirds, and so forth. It also keeps track of where I went. So it uses my GPS if you give it permission, uh, which I do. Uh, so the blue line over on the left sort of shows where I went. If you zoom in on that, you can see the trail that I followed and I went back on the road. Uh, this was one of two hikes I did at Don Edwards that day. So it's, it, the app is really nice. It records things, you know, where you went, what birds you saw and things like that. So let's shift gears. And for this set of birds, I thought I'd show a bunch of red birds. So I think most people know <laughs> what this red bird is, a Northern Cardinal. It normally appears on the East Coast, but in the last several years, it's been moving West. So recently I heard that they've reported seeing now in New Mexico. So I figure in another 10 years, we'll probably see uh, Northern Cardinals here in California too. Here's a bird you probably haven't seen, or you may have if you've been interested. It's a Northern Red Bishop. This I saw just behind Shoreline Amphitheater. It was there for two years in a row. I don't know whether it's gonna be there the next year or not. A vermilion flycatcher, they're pretty gorgeous. This one I, I saw off the road near Mount Hamilton. Here's a red-headed trogon that I saw in Thailand. When I, I don't, I have never taken a trip just to see birds, but when we go someplace, I often find some mornings or uh, hire, a, hire some, a birding guide to take me out for a day to look for birds. So this was during one of those events. I figure when I hire a guide that's local in the country where I am, I see probably five to 10 times as many birds as I would see if it were just me. Here's an iwi, which is in Hawaii. It's one of the uh, endemic birds there. And notice that it's up, I was up on Haleakala. Uh, the mosquitoes now carry a disease that kills most of the endemic birds in Hawaii. All the birds you see down near the water are imported. The, the endemic ones that have been there for a thousand years are all up high. You have to go up above four or 5,000 feet in order to get away from the mosquitoes. So this, I was up at about 8,000 feet for this. Um, he's an unusual, has an unusual bill. Here's uh, another red bird, the red cross bill. If you look real closely at the bill, the bill really does cross. Like, almost like, like uh, heavy duty scissors or clippers. And they use them to crack hard nuts and seeds that they eat. This is another type of bird where the female and male look pretty different. Females are all, always yellow and the males are red. Here's a cinnamon teal duck. We see those often in the Baylands. Oh, a hummingbird. This is only red because of the gorget, you know, his neck has this sort of reflective property to it. The same bird looking to the, whoops, wrong direction, sorry. Same bird looking to the left 
looks like this. So black chin, where it's with us, it's like that. Here is a red-headed woodpecker, a pretty classic bird in the East Coast. So people, second question they often ask is, how'd you get interested in bird watching? Well, I, as I mentioned, I grew up in Florida and we were often at the beach and I was always the first one up. So I would get up and go walk along the beach. It, it sort of had the beach to myself. I got to see what was new, what new shells or maybe new jellyfish or anything else. And bird watching is pretty much the same thing for me. I get up real early in the morning. I uh, go to some nice solitary place, which is usually gorgeous, uh, looking for me. You never know exactly what you're going to see. And I'm often there in the morning. This is uh, a little before sunrise down near Morgan Hill. But, you know, we. This is uh, in Ed Levin Park in, in the hills above Milpitas. Um, this is in March or April, I think probably March or April when the grass is green. So the places I get to go are really pretty. And I like being out early because I, I, I enjoy being in nature and just in, uh, relaxing and looking and listening for birds. A couple of years ago, we, my wife and I went down to the high desert to see the super bloom. Uh, this is east of, uh, El, of um, huge, in the middle of the state, forgotten right offhand. Uh, but when we go places like this, I, I usually go look for birds for an hour or someplace. Here we are up in the Sierras at a lake. And again, I went looking for birds. When we went to South Korea, one of our friends is from South Korea and she took seven of us to see the country where she grew up. And it turned out three of us were birders. So we hired a couple of guides to take us out for the day to find birds. I put this picture in just to remind me and everybody that when you're in a hobby like this, you often find somebody, you, you can almost surely find somebody else who is 10 times more into the hobby than you are. Um, this was a rusty blackbird that I had never seen before. And I saw an email that there was one near Half Moon Bay. Uh, and they told what beach it was at and things. So I went there. And when I got there, I saw this fellow lying in the water taking pictures of the bird. So I had an easy time of finding the bird, but I, and I'm excited about taking pictures, but I'm not willing to be lying in the cold water. I think the temperature of the water was about 50 degrees. I don't see how he did it. This is a common yellowthroat uh, in the Baylands. Pretty distinctive bird. This bird you often hear, but don't see. I apologize, I don't have sounds for these because the wind often makes the sound on my camera turn out not to be that great. So they say this is a common yellow throat that you hear more frequently than you would see. Here he happens to be up advertising on one of the reeds. This is, so we're looking at yellow birds in this batch. This is a lesser goldfinch. We also get American goldfinches here. This is a prothonatory warbler, which I saw in Georgia. Yellow's probably my favorite color. So this is, this is pretty gorgeous guy. He's got very distinct black bill and eye. You know, the highlights is yellow. Here's a yellow warbler I saw at uh, Rock Creek. Um, yellow warblers can be more yellow than this, uh, but this they all have these sort of orangey brownish uh, streaks on their uh, breasts. This is a great tit I saw in Israel not too long ago. You'll notice that there it has a, a ring. What they, in Israel, they call rings. Here we call them bands on its leg. The bands are made out of aluminum and they say who banded them, when and where. So that if the bird is caught again, they'll know how far it's traveled. Now, now, I mean, in the last 10, 15 years, they've developed small GPS receivers so that some of the bigger birds like hawks and uh, vultures and things of that sort 
uh, can carry a GPS with them. And when they're captured, they can download the data and see. But more recently, they've developed a very lightweight transducers where uh, different antenna on the ground can ping them and find out where the bird is and what its identity is. So they can track a bird where it's wearing something that's extremely light. So the, the, the idea of putting bands on birds to find out where they go is getting, uh, techni technically, they're getting better and better at that. Uh, this is a hooded oriole. We have three kinds of orioles that show up around here. I have pictures of two of them. Here's a Bullock's oriole. It's a little orangier and uh, has a black stripe through its eye. This is a Western tanager red head. A yellow breasted chat. Western kingbird, all yellow guys. And finally, a Western meadowlark. I saw a couple of those yesterday. Uh, probably the third question people ask me is, what camera did you use? Um, so here's here's a picture of me at uh, Don Edwards when I the other day when I was taking a hike. Uh, I use my binoculars as sort of my primary optics. When I'm at the marsh where I'm looking out over long distances, I carry a birding scope. It's got a magnification like it's a small telescope that magnification like from 12 to 36. There are bigger ones that are go from 20 to 60. But again, I like things that are pretty light that I'm willing to carry. Great big heavy ones, I'm not so happy about it. And similar to my camera, you'll see my camera is relatively small. It has a magnification uh, optical uh, zoom of one to 25. So I can get 25 times as close. And when it's a little bit cloudy with possibility of rain, I carry an umbrella. So I normally use my binoculars, to, well, I use my eyes first and then just regular eyes. Then I use my binoculars. If it's something really exciting, I grab my camera or if it's a long ways away, I'll use my birding scope. So I shift through different things depending on how close or how far away things are. Here's my camera with a zoomed all the way out to the 25 times magnification. So it's still only about nine inches long and it's really light. So I'm willing to carry it. I'm not willing to carry one of those cameras you see on the side of the football field sometimes, you know, that are like three feet long and weigh, you know, eight pounds or something. To give you a better idea of how my camera works. So I'm on a hike here. This is near Moffett Field. And I saw a bird fly into the, tr the palm tree on the left. So this is at magnification one, but if I zoom to 25, this is the picture I get. So, and because I have 20 megapixels, I can crop that and get this picture. So with my camera, I can go from, whoops, I can go from this to this. Uh, and clearly that's enough for me to realize that's a hooded Oriole, right? So when I saw my, I saw a motion of a bird going into the tree, I could then uh, use my camera or uh, binoculars to determine what it is. So for this set of birds, I've showed a bunch of woodpeckers. I showed a red-headed woodpecker a little earlier, but this is probably the most common one we see around here. I've seen them in my backyard and front yard and also uh, working on the telephone poles around us here in our neighborhood. These are Nuttles woodpeckers. Notice they have sort of dotted lines on their, all the way around down their back. This is the second most common, the downy woodpecker. It's got a few dotted lines down near the tail, but then it's got a white stripe down its back. And then the next one is a hairy woodpecker. It's a much bigger bird. You can see his, its bill is much sturdier. Woodpeckers and nuthatches and other things can climb on trees upside down and right side up. They can walk up and down things uh, both ways. So they can cover looking for insects and, and things. Uh, acorn woodpecker, a sort of clown looking guy. 
I, the acorn woodpeckers typically live in groups of eight, 10, 15. They gather acorns and stuff them into holes they make in trees. And then they often leave a guard there so that nobody takes them. So the six or eight others are out flying around looking for other ones. They leave somebody there to keep track of their storage. A red bellied woodpecker, I have no idea why it's called red. It doesn't have a red belly, it has red head, the red nape of it. So, but that's what it's called, red bellied. Uh, this guy looks like he's got rouge. It's a northern flicker. Northern flickers come in two kinds. This is an orange, uh, I've forgotten the word, orange tailed one. They are yellow tailed ones as well. Uh, sap suckers are in the same family with the woodpeckers. They drill holes in trees and then come back in an hour and lick the sap that flows out of them. Other uh, birds know this and that insects go there, so they'll often be there as well. So the sap suckers draw other birds and insects as well. Here's a Williamson samsucker, which is pretty rare around here. He was here last year, a little bit closer up of his head. Here are the sort of woody woodpecker, the pileated or pileated. There are people, half people say one thing and half say another. It's a little bit out of focus, but. When I was in Thailand, we saw an even larger one of these that's called a flame, a greater flame back. Again, it looks like Woody Woodpecker and uh, quite, quite gorgeous. Next question is, how do you identify a bird once you've seen it? Um, so I have lots of books and the web has lots of uh, tools for you know, learning about behaviors, where they occur, what color they are, how big they are, and things like that. Uh, Cornell, again, has a great app called Merlin, and it gives you three ways to identify a bird. By photograph down there near the bottom, sound or exploring birds. By exploring birds, what they mean is that you know where you saw it, when you saw it, about how big it is, and that it was blue. And you can sort of narrow down the birds that would be in that location this time of year and that are blue. Uh, with photo, if you have taken a picture, then you can zoom in on it. And I'll just show an example of that. So here's a photo of a bird I took in Los Altos recently. So I zoomed in on it. The next part, I, I say I saw it in Los Altos, April 20th of this year, and it'll look at the picture and come up with suggestions. And it says, hey, the best match for that is the Lazuli Bunty. Uh, and there are a few others in their unusual uh, colorations that might be a little bit close. The sound base one, which I'll show here, is you can, if you've recorded a sound, you can do it, but you can also do it live. So this is something, if you download the Merlin app, you go out in your backyard, turn on the sound, and it'll tell you what birds it's listening to. You know, it's like Shazam for birds. So here I click on Merlin, I click on sound ID, and then it'll start showing you the frequencies spectrum of the audio waves coming in. And when it recognizes something like a California toey, it shows you. And there's the sound of a black Phoebe, a song sparrow. And it can actually recognize two or three birds that are singing at once. So you'll see that it does that. So I, just for fun, you can download, it's a free app from, from the web and go out in your backyard and just get it going. And you can hear what birds you've got out there. Now, one trouble, when the first came out, um, I, you might have noticed that I said these make suggestions. They recognize them and they say, I think it's this, but they're not always perfect. And there was, when it first came out, 
several people started reporting really rare birds that that Merlin had recognized, uh, but they they hadn't seen the bird. They'd only heard the sound. Um, and the reviewers that are sort of checking the data for the citizen science said, wait a minute, we're getting all these false positives here for really rare birds. So they had to scale back and make things much more conservative and also tell people that it's not a perfect system. So here's an example where, you know, you're looking, you have a bluebird or a bunting in this case, I'm pretty sure it's a bunting and then you can find out what kind. There are all sorts of things you can find out about, you know, what this is sketches of them. You can look at, they'll show you pictures of what kinds of birds you might've seen. Here's where the female looks pretty different. And here's another section by another app called All About Birds. And it says things about the migration patterns. The orange up in the map on the right is where the birds are in the summer. Yellow is where they're flying and migrating and the blue is where they are in the winter. Also gives hints on how to find that particular bird. For this section, I switched to sort of the last set of birds is the raptors. Uh, and I wanted to look at small ones to big ones. And so the biggest ones around here are condors. So I went down to Pinnacles National Park and climbed up to the High Peaks Trail to look I saw and found a bunch. So here's a, a condor. Notice it has a number on it and a GPS tracker. So all the condors now are individually tracked and and if you go, if you, I think there's a number missing we don't see in the middle there. Um, but if you go to the web, you can find out who the parents are and what offspring it has and all sorts of things. Condors are impressive. Here's one flying above me. They have a wingspan of nine and a half feet. So they're huge. And we see them occasionally other places. I've seen one in, in Big Sur. Uh, you know, riding the thermals there, up coming off the the ocean. Here's a bald eagle we saw at, at Levin carrying a big fish. There's a pair that live at the in Ed Levin. An osprey, much different shaped wings than the eagles. Here's an osprey on the ground. pair of red tail hawks, which are probably the most common raptors around here. Here's a red tail hawk that was enforcing the no trespassing sign. A swallowtail kite. My wife and I saw this kite, it was part of what they call a kettle. There were about 10 or 12 raptors, some kites, some hawks, all spiraling up in a kind of like a funnel, you know, well, almost like, it sort of looked like a little teeny tornado of birds um, that they, they were flying up to get up high. American kestrel, which is pretty common around here. It's probably the smallest raptor we have. It's only about six or eight inches tall and as you see, quite coolly colored. And I have included owls in the raptor part. Um, he's giving me the stank eye, I think. Here's a horn, great horned owl and a baby great horned owl on the, down on the lower right. They sort of look like big fluff balls. A barn owl, burrowing owls, burrowing owls, don't, they can dig, but they don't like to dig. So they normally uh, let the ground squirrels dig the burrows and then they go take them over for a year or two. They trash them and then they leave and go find a new one. So they let the ground squirrels do the digging. Owls can, got good rotation in their neck. And as I mentioned, I wanted to encourage everybody to take a walk. Um, this is a, a nice little park that you may never have heard about. It's, it's called Guadalupe Oak Grove Park down off Almaden Expressway. You can stay down in the Oak Grove or go up on these little hills and 
and take a look. There are often interesting birds there. And not too surprising, the eBird has a, a site for exploring places where people have reported birds. And so this is in our area. You see Los Altos and Mountain View. There are like 150 sites just immediately around. And if you, again, if you download eBird and you do explore and say uh, Santa Clara County or something, you can click on any one of these and it'll tell you the name of the park. It'll give you directions to it and it'll give you a list of birds that people have seen, when they saw it, who was there last, you know, all sorts of things if you're interested in seeing them. And to, encur to help encourage people to take walks, I'm happy, as I say, I go out four or five mornings a, a week. I would be happy to go with you and help look for birds. So you're welcome to send me an email or give me a call or something. And I would be happy to lead a hike, uh, you know, if it's just you or you and your family or you and a couple of friends or something. And I was gonna close with one last uh, little video. This is a Western bluebird who didn't like the bluebird that was in the mirror on my car. So he spent some time trying to get rid of it, trying to scare it off. He had enough time that I could go get my camera and come back and. Okay. So with that, I would, I'll open it up for questions and uh, any comments. And I can stop sharing. So many kinds of birds, I, even I wasn't aware. Um, well, and I, I, as I say, most of my show were birds that are around here, right? That you could, they're actually accessible to us here. Bob, this John, do you know what the state bird of Minnesota is? <laughs> of Minnesota? No, I don't. It's the mosquito. <laughs> yeah, I can believe that. Well, they have ten thousand lakes, right? So, yes. I mean, uh, hey, uh, I was curious about the, the definition of a, a bird. It was, should be a warm-blooded, egg-laying uh, uh, something uh, by the position of feathers. So most <laughs> doesn't have feathers. Well, as you probably know, there are birds that push the limits, right? You know, there are a lot, some birds like, um, my mind is just senior moment here, um, where they, they can't fly, right? You know, there are lots of birds that have feathers, but they can't fly. Mm -hmm. uh, even turkey, those big turkeys I showed do fly. Uh, I was actually doing some work with robots a number of years ago in Alabama, and a set of 12 of them flew up to the tree in front of me and scared the dickens out of me. Mm. Mm. Bob, uh, yeah. who, who names the birds? Oh, so the person who discovers them first has the option to name them. Now, that's a little interesting, though, because recently the way birds have been found is they've, they've done genetic things, which they of course couldn't have done many, many years ago. And so they find that a bird they thought was one species is actually two species. And so then that means that they, usually one of them keeps the old name and then they, they come up with a new name. So the inventors of names now uh, often are from genetic analysis, not always, but often. And every year, the, the American Bird Association issues a revised list, and it's coming out in a couple of days, or maybe it's today that it comes out, uh, and it readjusts all the birds that you've seen and changes their species. Usually it's only one or two a year, but that's every year they do. Hi, Bob. Uh, thank you so much for this presentation. I'm sorry I, I was late uh, adding to it, but I have a question um, about things we might do at our houses if you know of anything. I, I have a, a bird bath that I love watching the birds in that. 
And I just didn't know if there's anything else that you, that you've heard of that is a, a good thing for birds or whether it's, you know, right. that's, you know. Well, bird feeders are generally good. Occasionally there'll be a warning about some disease that's being passed through it, but it's, and there was one about a year ago, but they're still pretty open. Uh, so feeders are good. There are plants there. I heard a talk, oh gosh, a number of years <clears> ago, of somebody telling us the kinds of uh, plants that you could put in your yard that attract birds. So if you Google that, I think that mm -hmm. would be a, mm -hmm. a positive. Well, and what about bird feeders? Uh, you know, when I had them before, they spill on the ground and then rats get in right. there. Yes. Is there any kind that works better than others? Um, I don't know. I've seen people trying to to defeat that, <laughs> you know, <laughs> trying to solve that problem, but I haven't seen a real solution. Okay, thank you. Yes. Bob, we had a, a red-tailed hawk hanging out in our fence in the backyard for a while. And my wife, Carol, was wondering if it was because I was uh, trapping squirrels. We have a terrible squirrel problem mm. and throwing them down in the creek. I'm right next to Stevens Creek. Oh, if that was drawing him, because he was there for probably four or five days continuously. That that could be because uh, they certainly eat squirrels uh, and they will eat small birds, too. So I thought you, I thought where you were headed was that you had a some people have bird feeders and there'll be a hawk that'll come and say, thank you for for attracting other birds for me. <laughs> but yeah, I think if you are trapping squirrels and throw them in that they eat squirrels. So that might be a, a good, good answer. Yeah, I used to have a bird feeder that worked pretty well. I had to modify it considerably to keep the squirrels out of it. Right. Uh, but it, it was quite successful. And I think I finally got rid of it. A mm -hmm. uh, couple, of, couple of reasons is they, uh, bird feeders also drop seeds. So you end up with weeds underneath them. Right, that's true, yes. I have a question. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Uh, in recent years, I saw a bird I'd never seen before. And I understand they come through this area and they have for a long time. It's called a variegated thrush or a varied thrush. Do you right. know that bird? Yeah. The most beautiful bird I've ever seen. He, uh, I saw him on the ground and flying around here, and sadly, he flew into one of my windows. So he oh, actually wow. died here, and I had a chance to see him up close and personal, and I'm so sorry I didn't take a picture. He was one of the most beautiful birds I've ever seen with all the orange and black and white coloring around his right. eye and, and the way his back feathers had white spots. Can you tell me a little bit about those? Do you yeah. know that they do come through here every every year, I guess? They do. Um, the place where I've seen them most frequently is uh, Windy Hill, which is uh, you know a little bit north of here, yes. and probably in Menlo Park, I think. Uh, um, mm -hmm. So certain times of year they come through and they are near the little reservoir there. Uh, but usually they're up higher, they're up toward skyline, and they like to be in the sort of dark trees. Yeah, uh, well, I've seen them in my yard Yeah, no, they uh, do come down every here. year for you know, a few times, not enough. I'd love to see more. Right. They're, they're a, they are a very pretty bird. They're, they're, they look like she should be a Halloween bird because they're orange and black, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're, mm -hmm. they're a pretty bird. Mm -hmm. Or they could be a giant. <laughs> yes, right. Orange and black. <laughs> uh, Bob, do you want to talk at all about uh, bird nests? Do you focus on? I don't. I don't know much about bird nests. I did. I will say something about a different topic that that Pastor Zhang had mentioned in one of the little write-ups about how to find a bird. So that's actually an interesting topic. Uh, the way I find a bird when I'm actually out in the field is I usually use vision first, but people have better hearing than I do actually use hearing first. 
Mm. So when like there's, and it seems to be the women have better hearing than men, I think in my little small example around here, they can hear a bird and they know the song. So they say, oh, you know, there's a goldfinch over here on the right or, a, or whatever it is. Um, and when we go look for it, we can find it. So I know that they're hearing it, they're correct, but my hearing sort of cuts off at a certain frequency. So I, I, I have to see it. So I look for motion, <laughs> silhouettes and color, and then a whole bunch of secondary things like shadows and ripples on water and you know things like that, that help me find where a bird might be. Uh, but hearing, if you've got good ears, that's a major asset if for, as a bird. Bob, I have a story. When I, when uh, my family and I moved in a, a parsonage four years ago, we found a, a bird nest in the backyard and uh, on the side of clothesline, two eggs there. And then oh. somehow we just come and come and by, and then somehow a couple of days later, the eggs are or disappear. Mm. Sometimes they destroy in the left when. So so usually what happens is something like a crow or some predator comes in and finds the egg. Uh, oh, and the, the doves, the morning doves and collared doves and things like that are not the smartest birds in the world, but they have a lot of eggs and nests. They'll have two or three a year, two or three nests a year. Um, and so they, they sort of overwhelm, or they seem to survive by, sheer numbers where crows if they find a nest will eat the eggs and things like that that's usually what happens we had a blue jay that uh discovered a, a nest that we could watch from our kitchen window <clears throat> and um they got the eggs out of one year and they kept coming back and back and back so i i made sure that nest wasn't a good nesting spot anymore good. the blue jays just took them out before they could you know <laughs> We, we had a nest uh, with morning doves on our front porch and some crows started coming and my wife started trying to figure out what in the world you could do to do it. And it turns out crows are really very smart. You could have speakers that and sound of like a owl or something there that the crows don't like. But if they if they're around and they see the speaker, they know that the speakers can make the sound. <laughs> And so they 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 learned somehow that it's not a real bird, and so that doesn't deter them. They can recognize individual people as well. Right. <laughs> There's a bird. That's right. So some birds are really quite smart. Uh, Bob Cliff Reinhardt has referred to me frequently as an old coot, and I wondered if there was. <laughs> Any relationship between my looks and the birds? <laughs> well, I don't know if you were on at the beginning, but I showed you a whole bunch of uh, American coots running across the water. Yes. Can you do that? No. <laughs> I bet you could with the right motivation. Yes. Yeah. I suppose. That <laughs> gun away. <laughs> This has been a beautiful presentation. Uh, I've really enjoyed seeing all these birds that I, I am not good at seeing the birds in the trees. I'm not good at hearing. I have no directional hearing. I can't tell where the sound is coming from. So I can't locate that by sound, but I love to go out in the morning, especially and listen to the birds. It's, it, there's a time frame in there just before sunrise that, that is really uh, nice. A uh, nice time to be in nature, and I appreciate your sharing all these beautiful birds that I don't get out and see. <laughs> right. well, you're I, welcome. As I mentioned, you can enjoy the sound, or if you want to be a little more analytical, you can download that Merlin app and just have it tell you what it thinks it's hearing, right? That's a good idea. I've, Cornell has been so big in birds for my whole life. My parents had a bird record of all mm. bird mm. sounds. And we loved listening to it, but we had a parakeet who also loved and chimed in <laughs> with all of the birds. And, and after we got the parakeet, we couldn't listen to the record anymore unless we were just playing it for his entertainment. Right. Because <laughs> we couldn't tell what the sounds were. <laughs> Any 
any mm -hmm. other questions? Uh, I'll repeat my offer that if you want to go out sometime, send me an email or a, uh, give me a call and we can find a time we can go see if we can find some birds. The good news is there are a lot of them around. That's a wonderful well, offer. Thank you. Maybe, uh, Bob, uh, we will uh, work on together with our leadership and we'll set a time sometime in the future, uh, have a hike with you and we're watching together. I think good. it will be a fun, fun uh, event as well. Thank you so much for your presentation this morning.